want to welcome all the SNY, as well as those on the live feeds of all of our METS social outlets. With that, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to METS President Sandy Alderson for his opening remarks. Thanks, Harold. I appreciate it. Um, uh, here today to uh, announce that, uh, or uh, <clears throat> through this group at least, uh, announce that Jared Porter uh, has been named the uh, general manager of the New York Mets. Uh, he's already on the job as of yesterday, and um, we're very pleased to have him. Uh, Jared came extremely well recommended from a variety of different sources. And uh, through our interviews, those recommendations were borne out. Um, Jared has, uh, in my mind, a vision that is very closely aligned to mine and uh, to that of uh, Steve Cohen um, uh, in a variety of different ways. Uh, but I think, you know, in terms of uh, sort of simplifying that vision, you know, Jared expressed how important it was to bring talent into the organization. Uh, not only player talent, but front office talent, talent across the board. Um, utilizing that talent in a culture that um, uh, gets the best out of everyone, uh, not only the players, but the coaches and uh, across the board. Um, I think he emphasized flexibility uh, in terms of uh, our player personnel, in terms of you know, how we approach uh, free agency and trades. Uh, the, the idea of being flexible across the board, which leads to, you know, a fourth of his pillars, which was innovation and an emphasis on, on how uh, we as an organization need to be uh, innovative in a variety of different ways. Um, you know, Jared has a very deep uh, um, familiarity with the game uh, across departments you know, from player development to scouting to analytics, uh, really has a wide ranging uh, uh, level of experience over uh, really quite a few years now. Um, he's also been with three different organizations. Um, there are some common threads there uh, from the leadership in Boston to the leadership in Chicago to actually the leadership in Arizona. But to the extent that he's been with different organizations, it's really given him, I think, exposure to how organizations uh, can change, how to affect that change, and uh, how to evolve as the industry does as well. So I'm very pleased Jared's um, with us. Uh, as I said, he's been on the job for just a couple of days, but he's absolutely immersed himself in uh, what we're doing. And uh, I'm very pleased to have him and uh, look forward to, you know, uh, many years of uh, connection and collaboration. So with that, um, uh, Harold, I'll turn it back to you or turn it over to uh, uh, Jared for his yeah. remarks. Thank you, Sandy. Jared, go ahead. We'll let you uh, provide some comments. Thanks, Sandy. I appreciate it. Um, just quickly, a few thank yous. I want to thank Steve Cohen and, and Sandy Alderson for, for selecting me for this position, for having the trust um, to put, put me in a role like this. Um, couldn't be more excited about it. I also wanna thank um, Ken Kendrick, Derek Hall, and Mike Hazen from the Diamondbacks for um, you know, allowing me to pursue this, this opportunity and for you know, really giving me the chance to put myself in position to be considered for this opportunity. You know, I think we're all a product of who we've learned from, who have taught us, where we come from. So a few more thank yous for me, for um, Theo Epstein, Ben Charrington, Jed Hoyer, Allard Baird, Sam Kennedy, Larry Lucchino, Raquel Ferreira, Brian O'Halloran, Tori Lovello, Amiel Sade, and Jason McLeod. As I think back to you know, when I started with the Red Sox in 2004, all those people have helped shape me over the years and I couldn't be more thankful for, uh, for their guidance and their continued guidance and friendship. I couldn't be any more excited to be here. Um, you know, I think New York is the greatest city in the world I think City Field is the best ballpark in the major leagues. Um, you know, I love that it's an incredible, passionate, energized fan base um, that, you know, in, the, in this, the place that the New York Mets organization has in the community. All of those things really excite me. Um, there's a strong core of players, a good blend of youth and experience. 
Um, of course, anchored by one of the best starting pitchers in the league and, and Jake DeGrom. Um, and overall, I'm, I'm excited to get to work, you know, with Sandy, uh, with Louie and his staff, the rest of the baseball operations staff, you know, as we look to build a, a collaborative and a sustainable baseball operation and culture. Um, ultimately, that'll be reflected by strong performance on the field. So like Sandy said, I'm already on the job. I couldn't be any more excited to be here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pumped to be a Met. Thank you, Jared. To ask a question of either Sandy or Jared, please click on the participants, participants tab, followed by the raise your hand icon at the bottom of your screen. With that, our first question is from Steve Gelbs of SNY. Hey, Jared, uh, congratulations. You were just speaking about how you, know, you, you dove right in, you're on the job now, um, but I would imagine there's a, a certain challenge to learning and evaluating a new organization while simultaneously looking to make potentially major signing trades to improve it. So what is that, that balance? What is that day to day like for you currently? And, and how do you expect that to go here in the very near future? Yeah, good question. Um, so, you know, I think there's some really talented people here. So I've been, I've been picking the reins, obviously Sandy is here, but um, you know, Ian Levin, Bryn Alderson, Tom Tanis, um, you know, John Rico, uh, they've been filling me in on where they've been at with things. And then, you know, I'm, I'm adding my insights as well, but it's been a learning process the last couple of days. Um, you know, we're, we're all, you know, we're all very aligned in the way we see things. Um, and, and they've been a great help so far. And, and I continue to work, you know, kind of move forward with that group and the decisions that we make. And then for Sandy, you spoke about wanting to hire somebody who would ultimately be able to grow into the top baseball executive in the organization. Uh, why did you feel that Jared was that guy as well who could ultimately continue to ascend? I think a couple of reasons, uh, you know, one of which I mentioned before, and that is he's, he's really got, uh, you know, a long history in the game with a variety of organizations, uh, uh, various experiences. And um, so in terms of background, I think, I think he's got that, uh, that platform, but also, you know, Personality wise, I think, you know, Jared is very well respected across baseball, not just respected, but well liked as well. Uh, and being well liked goes a long way uh, toward, toward being successful in this business. Uh, there are a lot of other things that come into play as well. But uh, in terms of Jared's personality, not just the fact that he's likable, but and has a Q factor of sorts, but um, uh, really has, uh, you know, the, the vision that we want to uh, execute upon. And how we execute on it is, is really a function of those personal qualities, communication, collaboration, inclusiveness. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, from a personality standpoint, as well as a, a competency standpoint, uh, Jared has tremendous room to grow. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very confident that he has the potential to uh, um, lead this organization over a period of years. Your next question is from Dave Lennon of Newsday. Hey, Jared, congratulations. Thanks, Dave. Um, I guess, first off, you know, a couple of people had said that some candidates may have been a little spooked by Steve Cohen's proclamation of having a, a championship within the next three to five years. Uh, I'd pose that to you, but you're, you've been in two situations beforehand that were, in, you know, on the verge of such things. Do you see many similarities between those two organizations, obviously in Boston and Chicago, that you can connect with your position here in uh, New York now? Yeah, I think there's, you know, there's uh, obviously a chance to really expand on the resources, um, you know, to hire really good people, um, you know, whether that's in the office, in the field, um, as coaches. Um, I think there's a chance to you know, really diversify and, and deepen the, the team, the player pool, the talent pool. Um, you know, Sandy uh, referenced um, my usage of the word flexibility. Uh, I think that's really important, versatility. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a real opportunity for that here um, to add. Uh, and as, as far as the, the winning part goes, you know, I've, everywhere I've gone, we've, we've all, it's, it's always been our goal. I think it's the goal of players to win. Um, I think it's the goal of front office people to win, coaches to win. So, um, you know, I think it's a challenge and it's something I'm really excited about. And, and just from the, do you feel much outside pressure, Jared, based on the fact that new owner, new front office, the expectations are just sky high here? How do you, how do you internalize that, the pressure that you're facing? 
No, I'm excited about it. I mean, I think professional sports brings on pressure in, in every form, you know? Um, so for me, it's, it's normal. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about it. it. It energizes me. It motivates me. And I think the same can be said, I would imagine, for the, the players and the coaching staff. So, no, I'm excited. Next question is from Ed Coleman of WFAN. Jared, congratulations. Welcome to New York. Thank you. Uh, I have one for Sandy as well, too, but uh, I know it's been a, a short time here and we've always kind of heard the analytics department, but is there a department in particular, player development, scouting analytics that you think needs upgrading right away? Yeah, it's a good question. I think I think right away, probably player development stands out as something we're going to look to upgrade. Um, we do have some great people there, so I don't want to take that for granted, um, but I think it's an area where we, we can add some depth. Um, and then, of course, you mentioned the analytics, the research and development. Um, that's critical as well. I think that's a part of a baseball operation that touches everything. Um, it really brings everything together. It touches the way we play every night um, with execution. It touches how we evaluate players, how we develop players. Um, so analytics is something, too, that we're going to definitely look to expand on. And uh, Sandy, for you, uh, uh, Dave Jouse, uh, I think we know well. He's been around the game a long time, but he's the bench coach. Why, why, why did you choose Dave? Well, uh, and we'll confirm this, I guess, later in the week. But, uh, uh, you know, one of the reasons that, uh, that we brought Dave on is because Louie wanted him. Uh, you know, Louie's known him a long time. The bench coach, you know, has a variety of responsibilities, but one of those is uh, the trust that the manager has in uh, the bench coach and being open-minded to the bench coach and the suggestions that are made. Um, so, I, you know, I think Dave brings a lot of personal qualities as well as his long uh, baseball experience to the game and, I, and also a relationship with Louie that I think will be you know, synergistic, if that's the right word, um, that, that really will allow Louie to be um, uh, as good as he can be uh, with that support. So, you know, Dave for us was, uh, you know, I won't say a no brainer, but uh, great experience uh, across the game as a bench coach uh, in the National League, although not recently. Um, but also, I think we'll, we'll work extraordinarily well with. Uh, with Louie. By the way, Ed, uh, you remind me of myself with that, that people often say that, but I, I'm looking at myself here. I think I look a little bit like Lester Holt with my glasses. Uh, maybe he gets his as Walgreens too. I don't know. Anyway, sorry for the aggression. No, speaking of uh, next best thing to Lester Holt, we'll go to uh, Bruce Beck of NBC next. All right. Congratulations and good luck to you. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, you helped break an 86-year drought with Boston, a 107-year drought with the Cubs. So what will it take to help break what will be a 35-year drought with the Mets? You know, what does it take to win? Yeah, good question. So I think what we've talked about the most is, you know, just a cultural shift for one, you know, um, you know adding, adding good people to the organization, um, improving on the organizational culture, um, you know, adding, adding depth to the roster. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's really important to create a situation where you're a really hard team to play against. You know, you're hard to, you're hard to game plan against in all areas. And over the course of 162 games, a lot comes up. There's, there's ups, there's downs, there's players going to slumps, pitchers get hurt, whatever it might be. And, you know, having, having, having a setup where it's really hard for teams to prepare against you because you have a good layer of players coming behind them is critical. So I think that's something we can attack right away. Um, that's a huge part of it. And then, you know, the, the cultural part's big too. You know, it's important um, to, to start to, to build a, a winning culture. And, um, you know, I, one thing we talked about through, throughout the interview process is that that starts in the, at the minor league level, you know, the kind of in the, the edge down there and it starts to trickle up. So, um, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. Ultimately, the players are the ones who, who win a championship. I think we all know that. Um, and, you know, they're the ones that get leaned on the heaviest and, and do the hardest work. But uh, those are the kind of the pillars that I would talk about. Next, next up is uh, Tim Healy of Newsday. Hey, Jared, congratulations. Uh, quick question, or not a, maybe not a quick question, but this is for both of you guys. Sandy, last month you said that you're going to be a little more involved in baseball operations now than you would have been if you'd gotten the president of baseball operations. Now that you have a GM, what is that power structure, power dynamic like for you guys? 
Well, uh, I'll try to answer that question first. Uh, maybe Jared won't, ha won't have to answer it. Um, I think it's, a, I think it's a, 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 a flexible arrangement. I think that, uh, for example, I've already turned a couple of things over to Jared. Um, uh, you know, we have, a, we have a daily baseball operations meeting. Uh, I've been on every one of those meetings. I'm not sure I need to be on every one of those meetings. Um, and there are lots of things that, um, you know, can be decided by Jared that don't have to involve me or only involve me uh, briefly. So I think it's going to be a function of, of how we, uh, you know, grow together over the next uh, few weeks and months. But, you know, just, just at the outset, I'm really confident that uh, Jared will be able to grow more and more into the role and into, um, you know, the responsibility that uh, I may not have to exercise. So, uh, you know, right now it's a, you know, it's a situation that will evolve, but uh, I think that we'll be able to work really well together. And my guess is that, you know, in some areas I will sort of recede in presence and in others, you know, maybe remain the same. But I think that uh, this has a chance to be a, a, um, a really, really good relationship. And I had a question for Jared too, uh, separately. You mentioned- Go ahead, Tim. Thank you, Harold. You mentioned player development and analytics as areas that need bolstering. As far as the major league roster specifically, what stands out to you as the greatest needs? Yeah, so I think um, I've, I've touched on it a couple of times here. Um, roster depth is important. Um, you know, I think it's, it's critical to have a real deep 40 man roster especially, you know, to get through the a full 162 and, and even, you know, coming off of a shortened season last year will, could pre present some new challenges. Um, so I think depth stands out right away. Um, you know, I think, I think that depth runs through the, the pitching rotation, um, you know, lengthening that out a little bit. Um, you know, the bullpen with the, with the recent May signing is, is, is looking deeper, but I think we'll continue to push that. And then from a position player standpoint, you know, I think up the middle is really important. I've always felt that way. Um, you know, the catcher position, center field, um, you know, and, and, and defensive versatility there too. The more, the more versatile, the more good, versatile, talented players you have, the easier it is to plug players in, um, you know, it gives you leverage in the decisions you make over the course of a year and of a season. So those are things that I'll, I'll work towards immediately. Next up is Anthony DeComo of MLB.com. Hey guys. Uh, congratulations, Jared. Um, Thanks, Anthony. A couple of quick questions, actually. One, how do you envision fleshing out now the rest of this baseball operations staff in terms of AGMs or anything of that nature? Yes, we've had some brief talks. You know, like I said earlier, we have some really talented people here um, that I'm, I'm learning more and more each day are, are, are really talented. And, and I've, been, I've been leaning on them the last couple of days and I'll continue to do that. And I think, you know, once we do, because they're here, there's not a lot of pressure to add right away. Um, you know, we're going to, we're going to keep talking, Sandy, myself, um, others in the department, um, you know, about who, who, what type of a person could be the best fit or people could be the best fit. And then, you know, as we, as we structure things throughout the organization, you know, we'll be adding, you know, coaches, analysts, um, things like that, but no, no immediate or imminent plans to hire anyone, but it's certainly, um, certainly on our radar and something we're, we're working towards and, and will eventually do. And also just on the roster, you mentioned a couple areas, obviously rotation, one of them, how much help in your eyes coming, you know, maybe with some external eyes here, does that need, and specifically, does it need kind of that upper caliber help at this time in your eyes? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think DeGrom, Jake DeGrom is one of the best pitchers in baseball, um, you know, having him anchor things in up top, uh, be a staff leader, uh, be that true ace, makes things great. I mean, it's, you know, it's a very enviable position for a lot of teams. Um, you know, I think lengthening it out is the most important thing. I'll, I'll we never rule anything out. You know, I think um, I think Sandy mentioned it the other day at some point in one of his in one of his um, press conferences, talking about shopping in the gourmet section, but also the meat and potatoes. And we're we're going to evaluate all pockets of the market, you know, and see where we may or may not fit. Um, you know, it doesn't mean we're going to acquire players in all areas of the market, but we'll certainly be be evaluating it. And if uh, something comes along that's a fit, we'll uh, we'll jump on it. Next up is Disha Thozar of the Daily News. Hey, Jared, congratulations. Thank um, you. So how did you, Sandy, mention that flexibility and innovation are some of the top things um, that are on your priority list and your pillars here? How exactly do you think the Mets as an organization need to be more innovative and um, how they can change and affect that change while, while you're here with them? 
Yeah, good question. So, I mean, innovation comes in a lot of different ways. I think the, the most clear way in baseball is just a continued commitment and investment to, um, you know, to research and development, to technology, um, to innovative ways to think, you know, how we, how we evaluate the game, how we blend uh, different information um, flows to make, to make the right decisions for the Mets. And then, you know, specifically at the major league level, just the in-game strategy preparation, um, you know, support staff that, you know, maybe falls in underneath the coaching staff. I think there are ways to be innovative there, um, you know, will help us put our players in the best position to go out there and execute and win every night. And then you, there was an earlier question that was kind of getting to this, but Steve Cohen mentioned that he'd be disappointed if he didn't win a World Series in the next three to five years. Just what is your timeline on it? What's your take on it if you had to put a number on it? Yeah, you know, I don't really want to put numbers or timelines on that. I, I would just say that, like, hearing comments like that motivates me. It really excites me. You know, it shows a strong commitment from ownership um, who, who wants to win, who wants to put a winner on the field um, for the fan base in New York, and I completely align with that. Um, it excites me. Um, I, I want those expectations, and I, you know, I, I, really, I really want to provide that kind of a, an atmosphere and a situation for the fans of New York. Justin Toscano of The Record, your line is open. Hey, Jared, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, was there a time in your career from the time you were an intern until, you know, now that you really thought that you would like to become a GM or a time that it hit you that it was really your dream or a goal of yours? Yeah, it's a great question. So I've always, I've always been a big believer, um, you know, in a term that I, I've used with people is, is you need to dominate the job that you're in. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you dominate the job that you're currently in, you're going to get more opportunities down the road. So I've been very focused at each, at each level, at each stop in my career, of doing a great job in whatever role I'm in. And I felt like if I do that, then I'm going to get opportunities to progress. And, and that has happened. Um, you know, it's, I think it's, it's most baseball operations executive dreams to be, to be a GM someday. So I'd be, um, you know, I have to say that, of course, you know, I'm really excited to be here. It's been a goal of mine. But, um, you know, in the, in the micro and each, each step along the way for me, I've always just really believed in focusing on the job at hand, focusing on the job that I have and, 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 and doing as, as great of a job as I can in that area. And then uh, you mentioned kind of parts of it throughout this, this whole call, but more concisely, when you were talking to, to Sandy and then throughout the entire process, what did you sell as, as your vision to the team that aligned with theirs? I think the things he said, I think the, the collaboration, um, the culture, the professional development, um, the innovation, uh, the flexibility, you know, and the, which comes in a lot of forms, uh, both on and off the, off the field. Um, I felt like we connected really well in those areas and, and aligned well, um, you know, as, as far as in the big picture from a leadership standpoint. Thank you. Next up, Tim Britton of The Athletic. Hey, I've got questions for both. Uh, first for Sandy, um, how well did you know Jared at the start of this process and, and what was it like to get to know him over the course of it? Yeah, I would have to say that I, I didn't really know Jared that well. Um, I, you know, I knew of his, uh, uh, his history uh, with, you know, three organizations and, uh, you know, his current uh, position in Arizona, but not somebody that I've ever dealt with directly. Uh, so, you know, from my standpoint, uh, it was initially about just knowing his background and uh, hearing uh, from other people who were close to him. And then through the interview process, uh, as I said earlier, you know, those recommendations were borne out. And uh, so, you know, I was taken immediately by his personality, the, the, the you know, his history in the game, um, you know, stands, stands on its own. But uh, from my standpoint, it was it was important that we find somebody who was personally, uh, one, committed to the job and enthusiastic about it. Uh, and secondly, somebody that I felt that, you know, we could all work with, uh, not because all of his uh, thoughts and um, um, vision is, is perfectly consistent with ours, but because I think he would drive the organization uh, to a higher level and um, uh, that he would bring new ideas as well as uh, a compatibility. So it was a combination of those things, but I think, you know, ultimately this, this will be a great fit. And then for, for Jared, congratulations first off. Thanks, Tim. Uh, 
And, and then, you know, you mentioned the, the idea that there's, there's the possibility of expanding resources here. This is a big market. It hasn't always uh, spent like a big market here. Uh, how, how appealing was that to you, the chance to kind of be part of uh, the start of something here with the Mets? Incredibly appealing. You know, I think um, another thing I could have mentioned in one of my recent answers was just the, the ability to invest in people. Um, you know, and, and invest in, in new technologies, um, you know, invest in infrastructure uh, is incredibly appealing. And I feel very fortunate to be in a position where, uh, where those resources are going to be provided to us. Thank you, Jared. Tyler Kepner, you're next of the New York Times. Hi, Jared. Congratulations. Welcome to New York. Thanks, Tyler. I want to ask you, um, what's the first time you can remember in your career, kind of like you know, making an impact on a player move and realizing like that if you dominate that job, you can maybe get into a position like this. Any, anything strike you, whether it was Boston or Chicago or somewhere where you, where you made a recommendation or you proposed something and you saw it come to fruition? Yeah. I think the first time I, I forget the year, but I remember we were up in the baseball operations suite at Fenway park and we were facing the Yankees. And I think there was a pitcher named Eduardo Ramirez, if I remember correctly, who yeah. was signed out of the independent leagues. And he was throwing really well against us. And Theo kind of said to a couple of us, hey, like, we got to do a better job on the independent leagues. Like, why aren't, why aren't we on these guys? Why aren't we more aggressive? Like, we got to figure out a process to improve this. And so we really committed ourselves to it. Um, and, you know, and, and I think it started to bear fruit. We, we signed Daniel Nava um, to a deal for $1, who ended up becoming a, a good major league player. Um, Robbie Scott was a, a lefty reliever we signed who got to the major leagues. Uh, Chris Martin is another one who now is in the Atlanta bullpen. Um, Rich Hill ultimately um, signed with us out of the independent leagues, even though he'd already been in the major leagues. Uh, Aaron Wilkerson. So there, there were a bunch of guys. So I would say that was the first time I remember, you know, making an impact that I saw, you know, impact a team that, that helped win a championship in Boston. That's great. And yeah, I remember Edward Ramirez, he had that change up. those crazies. Exactly. Um, <laughs> what, uh, and also, what does someone do with four rings from the Boston Red Sox and the Cubs? Like, where do you, do you ever wear them? Do you display them somewhere? Like, you know, you've already got what so many executives want to get. How, what do you do with four rings? I just, I keep them locked up. I, I don't, I don't wear them. You know, it's certainly, uh, certainly one of those things each along the way, each step, it's always great seeing people um, win a ring for the first time. It's probably the most exciting part of, of, um, of being part of a team that wins a championship is seeing someone who's worked in baseball for 20 or 30 or longer years and, and win a world series ring for the first time. So I always look forward to that, but no, I, I keep mine locked up. I don't, I don't wear them out. So sorry about that one. <laughs> Next up is Mark Carrig of the athletic. Hey, Jared. Um, congrats. Uh, you know, every Thank one you. of these calls, you're going to hear the guy who just got hired say, well, communication's important. Um, yet when you talk to people who work with you, they say that's the strength of yours. And I'm just kind of wondering, is that something that's learned over time? Did you learn it from somebody? Was there an experience that taught it to you? Because the one I keep hearing is he speaks all these different baseball languages. So how did you get to that point? I think as far as speaking different baseball languages, it just comes from opportunities to be involved in a lot of different areas. You know, and I think that's something that, that, that came up in the interview with Sandy is part of the collaboration is, you know, it, Every idea, you know, a good idea can come from anywhere. Um, we've talked about an idea meritocracy, so to speak. Um, you know, so, so for me, first and foremost, the more, the more you involve people, the more you let people make an impact, um, not only might you, you hear some good ideas, but you're also, it's, it's a great way for them to develop. So I was fortunate to be in a situation in, in Boston, Chicago, and Arizona where, you know, I was able to do that. Um, I think as far as the communication goes, in my opinion, it's all about relationship building. Um, you know, I really believe in people. Um, I try to be empathetic and authentic uh, when I talk to people. Um, you know, and I, I believe that the, you know, the scout in the Dominican Republic, um, who right now is evaluating a player who might sign for $10,000 is just as important as someone who's trying to sign a big, uh, a big free agent. And I always hope that that is reflected in the way that I treat those people and the questions I ask them and, and how much of the process they feel like. Thank you. Next up is Ken Davidoff of the New York Post. Thanks, Harold. Uh, Jared, congratulations. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I have to say, I did not have Edouard Ramirez on my bingo card. Uh, <laughs> when we started this. He just had one pinstripe on his uniform. He was so thin. Um, he wasn't on mine either. I just kind of just shot from the hip there. 
<laughs> uh, it's maybe more for Sandy, but I'll, I'll pitch it to both of you. You mentioned the gourmet section and uh, just Sandy's probably been more engaged in that. Just what you say, I think you've probably taken yourself out of one item in that section if, if a catcher clears a physical shortly, I think. Uh, but what do you see the, the timeline uh, in terms of those other items in the gourmet section? Well, <clears throat> let me answer that uh, first. Jared may have a different perspective. Um, so, you know, we've been running up and down that aisle over the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, Right now, I don't think that, um, you know, that part of the market is moving all that quickly. And so when you have different parts of the market that are moving at different paces, you have to make some decisions. You know, you have to, you have to make choices, uh, not only based on, you know, the, the, the player alternatives, but also the timing. So uh, it's, it's really hard to say uh, right now, um, Things are a little slower than the, in the gourmet section than they are in the uh, meat department, but um, you know that'll change. Um, I talked to one agent today who said he, you know, he has a very good player, not a free agent, but a very good player who might not. Uh, actually, he was a free agent, is a free agent, who might not sign until January or February. <clears throat> They're just, you know, playing it by ear. So, you know, these markets have been slow, but you know, often there are slow periods during any off season and it, you know, it's an ebb and flow sort of. So uh, we'll have to see, but um, you know, timing sometimes matches and sometimes it doesn't. And uh, you know, we have to make decisions uh, accordingly. And you talking, Jared talked about uh, building the roster depth, uh, but just in light of uh, the excitement you guys already have generated with these, these couple moves and, and who your owner is, is there any uh, imperative to, to get one of those gourmet items just to, to keep building on, on that momentum? Well, we'd like to build on the momentum, but uh, as Steve has said, we're not going to be drunken sailors either. So um, look, everybody knows how we're positioned right now. That's, there's no secret there. Um, but the fact that we're involved in those conversations, I don't think puts any more pressure on us. I think what the fans want is not that we win the off season, but we win the season. And there are several different ways to achieve that. And, you know, if we have X money to spend, we'll probably spend it, but we have to make decisions about how, how we do that. And um, so, uh, you know, I think we're, we're trying to be judicious, but we're definitely talking and we're definitely in the market and we never, definitely have the capacity. So what we really have to do then, uh, given all of those things, resources and so forth, is to make good judgments uh, about what we do and not be compelled to win the off season, but rather have our eye on the regular season. Thank you, Sandy. Next is Mike Fitzpatrick of the Associated Press. Hey, Jared, congratulations and welcome to New York. Thanks, Mike. Um, just a, cu a couple things. Um, first, you, you mentioned, you know, you wanted to thank a number of people when you started here. And obviously you've worked, you know, directly under some highly successful uh, and, and, you know, renowned baseball executives um, in multiple places. Do you have a, you know, a story or, or a, um, sort of a principle or a piece of advice that, that Theo or Mike or anyone else for that matter, you know, gave you over the years that really stuck with you. Um, and, and the other thing was, um, well, go, go ahead, go ahead with that one. Thanks, Jared. Yeah, I think, I think, good question. I think the biggest thing that I, from those guys, probably from Theo in particular is just to, you know, be convicted, you know, um, if you believe in something, uh, make sure you speak up, uh, give your opinion. You know, there's these, there's a lot of tough decisions that, that lead to a, a good quality baseball team. So uh, make sure you're, you're always giving your opinion and, and speaking up and, and speaking your mind. And that's something, you know, culturally, I want to make sure we, we create here is where, you know, we have a strong information flow and um, almost like a think tank stuff coming from everywhere. Um, I think that'll ultimately lead to the, to the best decisions for the Mets. And the other thing was just, you know, without getting into specifics or naming teams or anything, I mean, can you say how many, you know, if you've been through this with, with other teams at, at, at this level, you know, a round of interviews like this, um, where you, 
you know, either were offered a job or, or considered it, or, you know, we're, we're in the running for it very often, you know, how, 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 how many times have you gone through this year before landing this one? Yeah, I've had, I've interviewed other places. I've had opportunities. Um, when this one came up, I was so excited. I mean, this is, this is a dream job for me um, for, for the, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, um, you know, among others. Um, so, you know, once this happened and once, once Sandy and, and the Mets showed interest in, in bringing me on board, um, I became singularly focused on, on this opportunity and, and I couldn't be any more excited um, to be here today and uh, be a part of this group. Tina Servacio of Fox 5, your line is open. Thank you, Harold. Hi, Jared. Uh, congratulations and welcome to New York. Um, nice to it, it's interesting because Sandy earlier was talking about winning the season versus winning the postseason coming from working under Theo Epstein and coming from all the years that you spent in Boston, how much does winning New York city mean to you with the two baseball teams here? And, you know, the fan base is split, but winning over a majority of this, like you said, greatest city in the world. Yeah, I'm excited. You know, I think it's a challenge. I think, um, I think I, maybe it was Sandy who said it recently too, but it, you know, perception and reality um, are really important things. And, and um, you know, I think uh, reality is it's, it's a goal of all of ours to, to put a great product, a sustainable product on the field, um, you know, provide our players and coaches with, a, with the resources and an environment to go out there and succeed uh, day in and day out over a full season um, consistently. Um, you know, of course, the, the fact that there's two teams in the, in the city is exciting to me. Um, you know, I know there's a kind of a natural rivalry there. We get to play each other each year uh, multiple times, and that excites me as well. Um, but no, I don't, I don't think too much about, about that. You know, for me, it's, it's about how can we make the New York Mets better? Um, you know, how can we put ourselves in the position to go out there and, and, and win more games? Um, and that's, that's the focus at this point. Next up is Maggie Gray of the fan. Uh, I have one question for Jared and one for Sandy. Jared, congratulations. I was curious if you had any previous uh, relationship at all with Louis Rojas or any, have you had any conversation with the Mets manager? Yeah, I talked to Louis, um, I think yesterday, I'm trying to keep track of my days here. Uh, we had a nice conversation. He's down in the Dominican Republic um, in Santo Domingo. Um, I don't have a prior uh, working relationship with Louis. Uh, I've heard great things about him. Um, from a lot of people. I know some of his family members, uh, Jay Alou from the Red Sox. Uh, he's worked there, I think, for probably almost 20 years. Um, I think this might be Louis's uncle. Um, and then Jay Alou Jr., the agent, um, I've known for a while too, and, and he knows Louis. And then I think Louis has some strong relationships with uh, Junior Naboa and some others with the Diamondbacks. So I'm really excited. We had a good conversation. He's, he's energized. Um, he's excited. He, he can't wait to get things started um, this next season. And, um, you know, I, I can't wait either. I'm looking forward to meeting him in person. It's kind of crazy doing all these things over zoom. It's, it's nice because you, there's so much access to people so consistently, but I, I certainly want to uh, mm -hmm. get the chance to meet him in person. I'm looking forward to that. And just a question for Sandy. Um, you guys decided to sign James McCann. I was curious since you were in the market for a catcher, um, how would you describe any talks you may have had with JT Real Muto and ultimately why'd you make the decision to go with McCann? Oh, yes, we, <clears throat> we did have uh, discussions with JT and his uh, representatives, um, and they were great conversations. Um, I think that, you know, more than anything else, uh, this was a timing issue for us. Um, you know, we have a number of needs, uh, and, you know, we can, we can afford to wait to fill some of them. We can't afford to wait to fill all of them. And so this wasn't a compromise pick. We, we, we've been engaged with James uh, for a considerable period of time. Uh, there's a lot we like about uh, James. And so, uh, you know, in terms of, of uh, the two of them, you know, part of it was our really strong interest in James and what he's done over the last couple of years, what he think we think he can do for us going forward. But, uh, you know, at the same time, um, we have had conversations with JT. So, We'll see Wednesday or Thursday how those, all those talks uh, turned out. But um, uh, yes, the short answer is we, 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 we have talked to both. Dan Martin of The Post, your line is open. Hey, Jared. Um, Allard Baird described you as aggressive when he was uh, talking about you the other day. I was just curious, what, like, what's your attitude in terms of or how might that display itself in this job? Is that 
something about the entire organization or would that manifest in free agency or trades? Is that something that you, you want to hit the ground running here? Yeah, I think what he probably meant by that is just my aggressiveness in the pursuit of players. You know, I think, um, I think players, great, great players can come from anywhere. Um, you know, all parts of the world, um, all ethnic back, backgrounds, uh, all, all, all levels. There's so much latent upside in baseball. There's the buy low opportunities. There's minor league free agency, major league free agency, um, you know, first round picks, 20th round picks, $10,000 signings from Latin America, $1 million signings from Latin America. So I think the aggressiveness comes in, in really canvassing all those markets and uh, never stopping in the pursuit of, of good players. Cause ultimately to put a great team in the field, you need, you need players flowing from all those areas. So I think that's probably what Allard meant. And, um, and yeah, for sure. Uh, we've already been talking about it um, since I've gotten here. I'm excited about that. And have you, have you talked to much with Steve Cohen or is it been mostly just with Sandy? I have Steve. Um, Steve was part of the interview process and I've uh, spoken to him a few times since I started. Uh, we've had great conversations and I'm really excited to work for him. Next is Wayne Randazzo of Mets radio. Hey Jared, congratulations. Just a, a couple of questions about, you know, your current roster and, and how things are set up. We don't really know about the DH yet uh, for next year. So, you know, what are your initial thoughts on, on what a Pete Alonzo, Dominic Smith situation is going to look like? I think they're both great players. You know, I think the, the Mets and, you know, now that I'm here, we are incredibly fortunate to have both guys. Um, you know, it was, it was nice to see um, Smith break out over the last year and a half or so. Um, you know, become, become such a good major league hitter. Um, you know, he has some defensive versatility, which is great. Um, and then Alonzo, you know, to me, is one of the best first basemen in baseball. He's a, he's an offensive threat to hit the ball out to any part of the ballpark every time he comes up to bat. So um, to me, it's a huge plus to have both those guys in the team. They're a big part of what we're doing. Um, I haven't had a chance to talk to them or any other players yet, um, which I'm excited to start doing as kind of um, one of the next things on my agenda. But uh, both those guys are certainly a big part of what we do. How do you, you know, how do you come in as far as someone who's not been in the organization working with Sandy, who, who's been in the organization for quite a long time and, you know, put together a plan for guys who might be hitting free agency soon, guys like uh, Michael Conforto or Noah Syndergaard? Yeah, so those are good questions. I think, I think first and foremost, I need to listen a lot. You know, like I, I, I've always believed in that, um, you know, listen to people who have been here longer um, as I start to, to learn about players that, that, you know, that are here, that have been here. Um, you know, obviously the two guys you mentioned both have one more year of control remaining. Uh, they're both very good players uh, with, with Syndergaard coming off of an injury um, in 2021. Um, but, you know, I think I'll, I'll learn a lot more from Sandy and others. Some of the guys I mentioned earlier, John Rico and Ian Levin and, and Bryn and some others, um, you know, learn more about their personalities from Louis. Um, but, you know, for right now, I'm, I'm, I'm listening, I'm learning a lot about those guys and that that's going to continue to progress. I know, Sandy mentioned the next, you know, couple of weeks, few months. And part of that for me is going to be, a, um, you know, learning from them kind of how thing, how, how, what they think of the players and, um, you know, about these guys' personalities, their backgrounds and um, any talks that they've had that I don't know about. So, um, you know, I'm excited about all this. And, and th both those guys are great players as well as Alonzo and Smith. Next up is Zach Buchanan of The Athletic. Hey, JP, congrats. Thanks, Zach. Um, uh, I wanted to ask just over your, your four years in Arizona, um, wh what was it about that time and about that environment that you guys had in that front office that helped prepare you for this opportunity? Yeah, good question. So I think, I think a lot of the things I talked about, um, you know, in, throughout the interview process or that Sandy talked about, um, we were trying to instill in Arizona, um, you know, the, the collaboration, uh, the idea of meritocracy, um, you know, the ability for, for everyone to make an impact, um, building out a deep roster, a deep front office, um, a deep group of people where everyone had a role and everyone played a big role in, in the decisions that were made to help the team win games. Um, you know, I certainly learned a lot from Mike, also Tori Lovello um, as a manager. Uh, he's one of the best listeners I've ever been around. So getting a chance to interact a lot with Tori and his staff, um, you know, challenging them and them challenging us, um, you know, to help make the team better on a daily basis was something that I'll always take from there. It was the first time I had like a real opportunity to, to spend that much time with the major league staff almost daily um, throughout a season and throughout an off season. So I think those are probably the things that have shaped, shaped me the most from Arizona um, and, I, and, and will certainly help me in New York. 
Okay, we have uh, time for a couple more. Uh, Lindsey Kramer, Syracuse.com, your line is open. Hi, congratulations. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, I have a two-part question for you regarding the Syracuse Mets. Uh, before the pandemic last spring, uh, Chad Cruder was named the, the new manager of the Mets for 2020, the Syracuse Mets. Obviously, that didn't happen, so I was curious whether uh, Chad and his uh, the name staff for 2020 will, will indeed be uh, leading the Mets in 2021. And part two of the question is, in 2019, when the Syracuse Mets did play, the uh, fine team led by Tony DeFrancesco, it's more of a veteran team, uh, kind of a major league ready team with some depth, uh, a little bit bereft of uh, younger players. I was curious your assessment of um, where the organization, the system stands in terms of uh, uh, currently a AAA talent. So those are my two questions. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll answer the second question first. I think I think there's, you know, just looking at the, the organization, um, you know, AAA depth is an area that we're going to keep pounding on. I know uh, they've been working on it since before I got here this offseason, identifying players who can, who can be, be quality depth for us. And I, there's a difference between just depth and quality depth. I think it's a, it's a, it's a really important distinction. Um, so identifying players maybe, you know, with options remaining or at the end of the 40-man roster, um, you know, pushing players to AAA who can come up and help us during the season when they're, when they're performing and playing well down there. So um, that's going to continue to happen, already has um, since before I got here. And then um, I haven't got a chance to talk to Chad yet. Um, I believe Chad will be, is definitely will be back with the organization in, in 2021. I'm not sure exactly how things structure out as far as who's going to manage or coach where. I think we'll get on top of that soon. Sandy, I'm not sure if, that, if, if that's accurate or not um, with the, the minor league stuff. No, I think that's accurate. I think, you, you know, the, the Syracuse club is going to be veteran oriented. I think it's pretty clear that our, you know, the strength of our farm system is at the lower levels. We've got to be patient for that, uh, that talent to work its way up. So, I, you know, what I'm hoping is it, it will be a, a, it will be a veteran club, but a club that will be able to contribute at the major league level as well. Um, as far as, uh, you know, all of our staffing, uh, that will all be confirmed over the next couple of weeks, I think, but uh, certainly Chad will be back. I expect in the same role. Okay, uh, Tim Healy, we're coming back to you with the honor of the final question. Thank you very much, Harold. Uh, this question is for Jared, but Sandy can chime in if he wants. You touched on it with the DH stuff, but what is it like navigating the offseason, trying to put a team together without knowing all of the rules that you have to play under in 2021? Yeah, you know, I think – First and foremost, Major League Baseball, you know, Commissioner Manfred, Dan Halem, um, Morgan Sword, et cetera, down the line, did such a great year in 2020, you know, giving us the chance to go out there and, and play and have a season, you know, keeping the health and safety of, of players and their families um, at the forefront, you know, getting us through the season, getting us through the postseason, you know, crowning a World Series champion in a, during a pandemic was, was to me, a, a great accomplishment and doing it the way they did it. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely challenges that, you know, we're all dealing with all 30 teams have been dealing with, um, since March of last year. Um, you know, I think the 2020 season was a great opportunity for, for major league baseball to experiment with some, with some, some rule changes and, and whether or not those continue into 2021, we'll find out, but, um, you know, we have to be prepared. I think, um, I think being, you know, flexible, you know, to use that word again, it comes up here as well. You know, we have to, we have to always prepare for, for multiple outcomes. It's really important. Um, you know, no, none of this can ever be an excuse. You know, if, uh, you know, if, if two pitchers get injured, it can't be an excuse. You have to have um, more pitchers behind them. If, if two hitters aren't performing, not an excuse. Have two hitters behind them. If, you know, if, if there is a DH next year, if there isn't a DH next year, we need to prepare for that. You know, if, there, if there's expanded playoffs or if there isn't expanded playoffs, we have to prepare for that. So for me, um, always making sure we're ready in all those scenarios is important and something that, uh, that I'll always be pushing. Great. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Jared. And thank you to everybody else on the call uh, for participating today. We look forward to uh, being in touch and speaking again in the future very soon. Thanks, guys. Take care, everybody.